Hello, my name is Quentin Broussard. I'm Assistant Professor of Clinical Sciences at California Health Sciences University, and today we will be discussing multiple sclerosis. And the reason we're discussing multiple sclerosis today is that multiple sclerosis affects about 2 million people worldwide, and multiple sclerosis can lead to very debilitating neurological injury, as well as potentially permanent disability. While there's no cure currently for multiple sclerosis, we can do drug therapy potentially to decrease the incidence of relapses or essentially multiple sclerosis exacerbations that may occur with multiple sclerosis. And those drugs are what will be the main highlight of today. Our objectives today will be to classify the types of multiple sclerosis, to compare and contrast treatment options for multiple sclerosis, and to assess pharmacotherapeutic agent selection considerations for multiple sclerosis. So when would you choose one agent versus another? Um, sometimes that may be a cost issue, sometimes it may be a dosage form issue, and sometimes it may be which drug um, has the least amount of side effects potentially. So we'll examine those objectives today. We'll start off with a patient case. GT is a 36 year old female presenting to her physician for an annual checkup. She was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis three years ago after her second multiple sclerosis flare in two months. Following her multiple sclerosis flares, GT has had no other MS flares. Besides her two flares, she's had no other symptoms at all. Which type of multiple sclerosis does GT most likely have? Is it relapsing remitting, secondary progressive, primary progressive, or progressive relapsing? Staying with GT's case, GT's multiple sclerosis has never been considered aggressively or rapidly evolving by her, by her physician. Which of the following agents is GT most likely to be on considering her disease course? Is it alemtuzumab or Lemtrada, dimethylfumarate or Tecfidera, fingolimod or Jelenia, or natalizumab or Tasabri? And the last question relating to GT is which of the following agents may cause GT to have bradycardia and atrial ventricular block or AV block? requiring cardiac monitoring after the first dose is administered. Is it alemtuzumab, Lemtrada, dimethylfumarate, Tecfidera, fingolimod, Jelenia, or natalizumab to Sabri? So after today's talk, you should be able to answer each of these questions confidently. To start off today, we first need to define what multiple sclerosis or MS actually is. And to take it on a very, very simple basis pathophysiologically. Multiple sclerosis is essentially an inflammatory disease of the CNS or the central nervous system where there's a destru destruction of myelin and axons. Remember myelin is basically the protective layer surrounding the neurons and the axons which basically protect the neuron from damage. In multiple sclerosis, however, you have a what is known as a demyelination. So myelin is no longer on those axons or parts of those axons, which essentially predisposes the neurons and the axons to damage or sclerosis. So in terms of the definition of the actual term multiple sclerosis or the disease state at multiple sclerosis, multiple refers to the number of CNS lesions that a patient may have. So when a patient has axons that are demyelinating, particularly in the CNS, those axons are no longer protected. And as a result, those axons and neurons essentially get destroyed. And a large part of those CNS or CNS axons and neurons are essentially in your spinal cord as well as your brain. So whenever these things start to um, get attacked more or less because they're not protected, that develops lesions and multiple lesions essentially constitutes the multiple part of multiple sclerosis. In terms of the sclerosis part, it refers to the demyelination. 
um, lesions of the CNS area, and these are also referred to as plaques. In terms of epidemiology of MS, MS affects about 250 to 350,000 Americans, so not necessarily the largest part of our population, but still a significant number of Americans have MS. And it affects about 2.3 million people worldwide, and that number is obviously growing with the increasing world population. Diagnosis typically occurs when patients are younger um, in their adulthood, between 20 and 50 years old. And multiple sclerosis affects more so women than men in about a 2 to 1 ratio. In regards to patients who have multiple sclerosis, a majority of patients who have multiple sclerosis are of North American descent. Um, and if you'll actually look on the next slide whenever we talk about the distribution, it actually correlates to a specific latitude level. In terms of the progression of multiple sclerosis, about 50% of patients will need assistance, walk assistance walking within, the next, within 15 years of disease onset. So essentially, multiple sclerosis is a very debilitating illness. Um, and as a result of that, patients may not be able to function as they normally would, particularly with their activities of daily living. So this obviously needs to be monitored. Um, and anything that we can do to minimize the risk of this occurring um, or to minimize the progression would be beneficial for the patient. Now going back to essentially the risk and the distribution of MS, if you actually take a look at this map here from weharthealth.org, they essentially map out the risk of obtaining multiple sclerosis by the region that people live in. And as you see here, um, Americans, um, not only of the United States, but also of Canada, have the highest risk of multiple sclerosis. And if you actually correlate that along the latitude lines correlating to Canada as well as um, the northern half of North America, if you go across to the European and Asian side, you actually see that you see a similar incidence here as well. You also see that below that latitude line, most of the world has a low or probable low risk of developing MS until you get to the essentially the opposite latitude on the southern side in Australia and New Zealand here, right on this eastern side. So essentially, it may have something to do with the area that the patient is in, or essentially the latitude. So basically, what I want you to kind of get from this slide is that as um, North Americans, we do have a high risk of developing MS compared to other parts of the world. Though again, like I said earlier, not many people do have MS worldwide. It's only about a little over 2 million. In regards to the pathophysiology, the pathophysiology of MS is very poorly understood and relatively unknown. There are lots of theories that are out there regarding the pathophysiology of MS, but no direct pathophysiology has been cited as conclusive at this time. Um, it's believed that there may be a combination of some genetic factor as well as another non-genetic factor. It is possible that MS can be passed on from generation to generation. But many times, patients may have a non-genetic factor that plays a role. Um, some of those non-genetic triggers are things such as viruses, metabolism, or even environmental factors, such as pollution or other things outside in the environment that may actually trigger the development of MS later on. Overall, though, the pathophys is relatively not well understood, and it's not something that I would expect you to know for an exam purpose. Um, but it is interesting in the fact that we really don't exactly know what is going on with MS. We just have 
um, an idea of the inflammatory cascades, but what is actually triggering it, it's questionable at this time. In regards to this next slide, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an idea of essentially the progression of disease in terms of MS. So as you see here, obviously this is the brain. And whenever you actually take different views of the brain along a lateral sense or basically a transverse sense, if you want to look at it from a plane, on this left bottom part here, you see an example of a healthy person's brain and spinal cord areas where essentially you have gray matter, white matter, as well as your ventricles here. However, in MS, because you're having demyelinated um, axons and demyelinated um, neurons essentially, you develop these demyelinated lesions. So remember, our brains are highly um, neurological in the sense that they have lots of these axons and lots of these neurons. And whenever you have MS and you're demyelinating these axons, essentially those axons are no longer protected. Those neurons are no longer, no, no longer protected. So other things can attack them, such as your um, inflammatory system, more or less, or your immunological system, I should say. So whenever you have a patient presenting with MS, um, the most common type being relapsing remitting disease, we see demyelination, particularly of white matter here. And whenever you have demyelination and destruction of brain tissue and spinal cord tissue, obviously the, that brain and spinal cord tissue serves a purpose to an extent um, in communicating with the rest of the body to function properly. So you may see patients that have other problems, not even just related to neurological issues, but essentially the baseline issue in MS is that because you don't have neurons and axons that are protected, any process that eventually goes downstream that involves um, neurological communication may be altered. And we'll see that whenever we talk about the symptoms a little later. In terms of progressive MS disease, you see lots of this demyelination continuing on in these little colored spots. And potential atrophy after you've actually had a lesion beforehand. And that atrophy is obviously not good for the patient because if you have atrophy and demyelination of areas and destruction of areas, that area is not able to synthesize itself back as it is with other potential organs like per se the liver which regenerates relatively well in comparison to the other organs. The brain is a very important organ um, and that's an, always important to remember that. So anything that we can do in MS to try to minimize this process of demyelination and progressive disease to occur is beneficial to the patient. This upper part here just sh shows essentially the spinal cord cervical, thoracic, and lumbar pieces of the spine um, and how they correlate to MS and how MS essentially demyelates the spinal cord as well as the brain. In terms of risk factors for MS, a family history of MS, as we stated before, may potentiate a patient to develop MS um, later on in potentially adding to that an environmental factor possibly. Um, also autoimmune diseases as well as patients who have a history of migraines. Again, autoimmune disease, migraines. Um, and then in terms of another environmental factor um, that may be a risk factor for MS is cigarette smoke exposure. Uh, whenever we inhale cigarette smoke, just think about patients who develop respiratory disorders and develop lots of infl um, inflammation as a result of developing as asthma or COPD, for example, particularly COPD. A lot of inflammation is going on in terms of that. So if you think about what kind of effect it can have on the lungs, it can also have pretty severe effects on your brain as well. And the brain is essentially the area, as well as the spinal cord, where MS is occurring. 
Now, obviously, the pathophys of that is a lot different, but again, with the pathophys of MS, it's clearly not very well understood. So these are just some potential risk factors that you may see. In regards to classification of MS, MS is classified into four different types. You have relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, or RRMS. You have secondary progressive multiple sclerosis, or SPMS. You have primary progressive multiple sclerosis, or PPMS. And progressive relapsing multiple sclerosis, or PRMS. So essentially, we have a lot of different types of multiple sclerosis, and they do sound very similar. Um, I'm not going to expect you to know the abbreviations for the exam. Um, I'll probably actually list out the full name of the type of MS if there is a question on um, trying to classify one of these types of MS as well as their four-letter abbreviation, just an FYI. So the first type of MS we're going to talk about is relapsing remitting MS. It's actually the most common type of MS comprising about 85% of patients. Relapsing remitting MS is classified by flare-ups, relapses, exacerbations, followed by periods of remission. So essentially these patients are having, you know, very nasty neurological, essentially flares where, you know, it can be very, very painful for some patients. Um, However, after the flares, their symptoms improve or disappear whenever they do not have a flare, a relapse, or exacerbation. So it's important to realize that with relapsing remitting, you have relapses, but then you basically remit into a um, time period where your symptoms either improve or completely disappear. So these patients essentially mostly have flares, though some patients may still be debilitated even after their flare occurs. The next type of MS we'll talk about is secondary progressive MS or SPMS. This may develop in patients who already have relapsing remitting MS. And in terms of secondary progressive MS, secondary obviously refers to the fact that there is already disease there. And now your patient who had per se an RRMS um, type of MS now is developing more progressive disease. So essentially the disease course worsens with or without remission periods or leveling off of symptom severity. So there may not necessarily be plateaus in this secondary progressive type of MS. However, of note, secondary progressive MS is very, very rarely diagnosed but it is still a possibility. The next type we'll talk about is primary progressive MS or PPMS. PPMS or primary progressive affects about 10% of MS patients. And typically with these patients, symptoms worsen from the beginning gradually. So once a patient's diagnosed with PPMS, their symptoms will just get worse from the beginning with no relapses or remission. You'll note here that the actual term does not include the word relapsing, so that's important to know. Um, occasional plateaus may be present where they may have the same severity of symptoms. Um, however, because of this disease um, process being more progressive than some of the other types of MS, it is more resistant to drug therapy. And a lot of the drug therapy that is currently out there is actually targeting relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. Though it doesn't necessarily always mean that other types of MS are completely excluded from drug therapy. The last type of MS we'll talk about is progressive relapsing MS. And this is relatively rare. Only about 5% of MS patients have this. And it is progressive from the beginning. Um, however, with this one, you do have symptoms of relapse, um, of worsening symptoms throughout the disease course. Um, but you have no periods of remission. So you may continue progressing in terms of your disease severity. However, you will still have relapses where your symptoms may get worse. 
and it's a little bit hard to come back from that because this disease process is pretty obviously progressive, no pun intended. And again, it's pretty rare compared to the other types of MS, only affecting five patients, five percent of patients. So in regards to MS, like we kind of talked about a little bit earlier, um, talking about the pathophysiology and essentially the destruction of axons and neurons, any process in the body that in involves neuronal communication can obviously be a major problem. So if you remember back whenever you learned about for example, um, urinary incontinence. A lot of that actually did involve um, different neuronal pathways. So things that involve neuronal pathways may be affected in MS. So things like bladder disturbances, so like urinary incontinence is a big thing that these patients will actually present with. They have, may have moderate to severe spasticity in their legs. They may have sensory disturbances. Remember neurons essentially control your eyesight. You have a lot of neurons that go to the eye that communicate with your eye and um, bring and take things back to the brain and the spinal cord. Um, dysesthesias, um, diplopia or double vision, ataxia, basically uncontrolled movements, vertigo where patients feel dizzy, again bladder disturbances, unilateral numbness affecting one leg, sometimes it can affect both legs, sometimes it can be bilateral numbness. Um, neuralgias are very, very common in MS patients, and you may have to treat a patient's pain, um, a patient's nerve pain that, um, that has MS. You may get optic neuritis, or essentially inflammation of the optic nerve. Um, constipation is another big thing. Fatigue, patients are chronically tired and exhausted because they're constantly in pain and other processes are going on in their body that just make them constantly exhausted. Sexual dysfunction. You need lots of different neuronal pathways to make sure that patients are able to be sexually active. Um, and you may also have psychiatric disturbances, which a lot of these patients will have comorbid um, psychiatric disturbances. Um, most of which you will talk about later in the semester in Patient Care 3. In regards to diagnosis from MS, there's no real single diagnostic test um, for MS specifically, though there are obviously some recommendations of what you can do to diagnose it. Um, you want to ideally find evidence of at least two damaged areas of the CNS or central nervous system. Obviously two um, correlating to the multiple part of multiple sclerosis. You want to determine if the damage has occurred also at least one month apart such that you know you can exclude things like trauma um, because sometimes you may get um, brain damage obviously from trauma whenever we talked about traumatic brain injury. So you want to see that this um, disease state is actually being progressive to an extent. Remember not all types of MS are highly progressive but MS is a developing disease state and it does get worse over time in any of the types of MS. It's important to observe symptoms for more than 24 hours and episodes separated by at least one month. You also may want to get MRI imaging on patients, particularly with MS, and that can help to detect some of these lesions that you see here. Obviously these white parts with the arrows here are where the lesions are at, so you see clearly four lesions here on MRI. Um, you can also do a spinal tap potentially, and this isn't necessarily concrete for every patient to examine for what's known as all clonal bands, which may be significant for MS. Another big thing with MS is that MS is essentially a diagnosis of exclusion. Because we don't have a single diagnostic test to diagnose for MS, usually what happens in practice is um, patients come in with symptoms that we mentioned previously, 
and they may be treated for those other symptoms, but they may not necessarily be diagnosed with MS up front as a primary diagnosis. You might have to see a constellation of symptoms um, to actually have an idea that there may be a possibility of MS on a physician's differential. And a lot of times these patients may not get diagnosed until months later, or sometimes even years, depending on how they present. So that's a very important concept to understand with MS. Um, we may not actually be identifying MS properly um, because there may be many other patients out there who have MS that have not been properly diagnosed yet. So kind of going back a little bit to the disease progression, um, as time goes on, um, you see here on this red solid line that in pre-symptomatic disease, you have relatively um, pretty good brain volume. But as the time goes on and on and on, that brain volume actually decreases as a result of the lesions developing. And as you see here with this dotted blue line here, you see underlying disease progression increase over time. This dotted red line here is axonal loss, um, essentially axon and neuronal loss, more or less. And you see here a little bit of some other things. Um, one of them is called clinically isolated syndrome. Um, and it, clinically isolated syndrome is not necessarily something you need to know about. Um, I'll give you just a brief little intro to it though. Um, clinically isolated syndrome is when patients essentially present like they're having MS, but it's only for one episode. So it's essentially similar to what it actually sounds like. And clinically isolated syndrome is very, very hard to characterize. So that's something that you're not necessarily expected to know about. Um, but basically what I want you to get from this graph is that MS is very progressive no matter what kind of MS you actually have, whether it be relapsing remitting disease, secondary progressive disease, primary progressive, it doesn't matter. MS over time gets worse and that's due to essentially the axonal loss that these patients have. So in terms of the goals of therapy, what we want to do in MS is to prevent permanent neurological damage or to minimize it where possible. And sometimes we not, may not be able to prevent permanent neurological damage all the time. But we, ex we can always, you know, make attempts to try to do whatever we can to try to minimize neurological damage. We want to decrease relapse incidence. So we want to ideally um, minimize the amount of relapses or the amount of time spent in relapse um, for these MS patients because relapses are essentially some of the worst experiences for these MS patients particularly, particularly those with relapsing remitting disease. We want to obviously avoid disability if possible, though a lot of patients like we saw will be disabled 15 years after um, their initial diagnosis. We also want to maximize these people's quality of life. So now to discuss the treatments for MS. Um, the first thing that we'll start with is first line therapy. Um, and that consists of either dimethylfumarate or tecfidera, teraflunamide or albagio, interferon beta, which has a lot of different formulations such as Avonex, Plegridi, beta Siron, Extavia or Rebif, and glutiram or acetate or copaxone. The first first line agent we'll discuss is dimethylfumarate or tecfidera. Um, and essentially what Tecfidera does for MS is it induces expressions of anti-inflammatory proteins. Remember, MS is an inflammatory disease. Therefore, any anti-inflammatory activity could be potentially helpful. Important thing to know with Tecfidera or dimethylfumarate is that it's available by mouth. And the dosing of it is traditionally 240 milligrams by mouth twice a day. One important thing to note with these MS therapies is that whenever they're studied, they study how much reduce, reduction in clinical relapse rate actually occurs. 
So for, for Tecfidero, in, return, in terms of reduction of clinical MS relapse rate, um, Tecfidero is estimated to reduce relapses by about 50%, which is pretty nice um, whenever you compare it to other agents, which may do a little bit less in the first-line therapy. Though you can still use any therapy first-line, um, even regardless of its clinical relapse rate reduction. Um, in terms of adverse effects, um, one adverse effect that Tecfidero or dimethylfumarate is known for is flushing. And similar to other medications like niacin or niaspan, you can take um, a, um, a full strength aspirin, 325 milligrams by mouth, 30 minutes prior to administration of dimethylfumarate to try to reduce the flushing. You may also see abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Um, a lot of these medications will have um, lymphopenia or neutropenia associated with them. Um, another big thing with Tecfidero is that it does have potential for hepatotoxicity. And Tecfidero also has potential for what's known as progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy or PML. And we'll talk about PML a little more whenever we get to natalizumab or to salbury. Um, but just um, recognize that this is a potential side effect with a lot of the MS medications, particularly natalizumab or tisalbri. Next, next agent in the fir first line we'll talk about is teriflunamide um, or albagio. It's a pyrimidine synthesis inhibitor which reduces T and B cell activation function and proliferation. This medication is also available PO. In regards to its dosing, it's dosed between 7 and 14 milligrams by mouth daily. And it has less um, of a reduction of cl in clinical relapse rate compared to Tecfidera. This one only reduces clinical relapse by about 30%. So therefore, it's probably not used as much, though it, again, it's still a first-line option. Its adverse effects include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, hepatotoxicity, electrolyte disturbances, acute renal failure, um, Steven Johnson syndrome, or TEN also. So basically major skin reactions, and in these cases, the medication should be stopped. Um, this medication can also cause alopecia and neutral and leukopenia. Some important things to consider whenever you're, you have a patient who's on teriflunamide is that it is contraindicated in pregnancy. So you want to ideally do a pregnancy test in patients um, who are of childbearing age before you start a patient on teriflunamide or albagio. Um, you also want to screen for TB um, because this medication can reactivate latent TB and convert it into active TB. Um, and you also do not want to administer live vaccinations while on this therapy. And this consideration applies also to a lot of the other MS drugs. So these considerations that we have listed here are pretty important, especially on the outpatient side or when you're trying to start therapy for these patients. So it's important to make sure that you have appropriate screening tools for each of the medications that we'll talk about today. Interferon beta is the third agent in first-line therapy for MS. Um, again, it has many different um, formulations as well as brands. Um, it has several anti-inflammatory and immune modulating mechanisms which may um, prove beneficial in, in, um, in MS. It's available parenterally as an IM or a sub-Q injection. And the dosing really just depends on the formulation that you have. Um, some of these formulations are pegylated. Some of these are interferon beta 1A. It just depends on the formulation that you have. Um, so it's important to realize what formulation you have available and realize that the doses of those formulations will be different, um, most likely. In regards to its production and clinical relapse rate, it reduces clinical relapse in about 30 to 35%. However, interferon beta should be used very cautiously. It has lots of injection site reactions. Um, with most interferon products, um, it may cause flu-like symptoms or depression and suicidal um, ideation. 
Uh, and that's a big thing that you should counsel a patient on if they are on one of these interferon products, um, particularly interferon beta. It may cause hepatotoxicity as well as lymphopenia um, or leukopenia. The last agent in first-line therapy is glutaramer acetate or capaxone. What it does for MS is it suppresses T-cell activation and induces and activates suppressor T-cells. So essentially, it's trying to reduce that um, inflammatory response that can prove very detrimental in MS. Um, Glutaramer acetate is available sub-Q, um, and it's dosed either 20 milligram sub-Q daily or 40 milligram sub-Q three times weekly. Um, like most of the other agents in the first line therapy um, category, its reduction in clinical relapse rate is about 30%. So again, a little less than Tecfidera dimethylfumarate, which is about 50. Adverse effects um, with any injectable medication, you may see injection site reactions. Um, particularly with this medication, you may see flushing, chest pain, palpitations, and dyspnea post-injection. So the first time that you give this medication, you may want to monitor the patient closely. You might even want to have them inject this medication um, in the doctor's office or um, inpatient. You may develop menstrual disorders if um, patients are women um, on this medication. Patients may also be at increased risk of urinary tract infections or leukopenia. Um, and again, because a lot of these things do suppress the immune system, it's important for glutaramer acetate because it does suppress um, T cells that admit live vaccines do not be administered well in this therapy. So that's essentially the first line therapies. Now what happens um, if your patient um, fails a first-line therapy, or say if they have very progressive MS, um, then in those cases, you can, may start a second-line therapy. And a second-line therapy, like I kind of alluded to just now, can be started either after a first-line therapy is started. Traditionally, um, a lot of these therapies are not started together because obviously they have pretty nasty side effect profiles. So that's another thing to keep in mind as well um, of why a lot of these agents are not used in tandem together. Um, however, you can potentially start a second line therapy um, per your reading, um, per the review article provided that I gave y'all to read. Um, if the patient has very severe or progressive disease, um, and that would have to be determined by a physician. But the second line therapies that are available for MS are natalizumab or tasabri, fengolimod or gelinia, and alentuzumab or limtrata is the training for that one. For natalizumab or tasabri, um, natalizumab or tasabri is one of the most effective agents at reducing clinical relapse in MS. It's a recombinant humanized monoclonal antibody, and it prevents leukocyte migration across the blood-brain barrier. So essentially, it's preventing a lot of that inflammatory response to occur um, from the periphery going into the CNS, so preventing leukocyte migration. It is available IV, and the dosing of it is 300 milligrams IV every four weeks. And sometimes these patients might have to go to outpatient centers, um, outpatient infusion centers where they can get this injected um, IV. In terms of its reduction in clinical relapse rate, compared to other agents, it does fantastic in that it can reduce clinical relapse by 68%. However, it does have some nasty side effects associated with it. Um, in terms of natalizumab, it may cause headache, fatigue, arthralgias, um, depression, infection, because it is a monoclonal antibody as well as um, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which is pretty much one of the big hallmark adverse effects of this medication specifically. What progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy is, is it's essentially a complication that can be brought on 
by what is called J.C. virus or John Cunningham virus. J.C. standing for John Cunningham. And essentially this virus exists in about one third of um, the population in general. So if these patients um, have J.C. virus um, underlying, for example, and you give them an agent like natalizumab, which is essentially going to suppress their immune system, you may have um, essentially an activation or a worsening of this J.C. virus. Now, in most patients that have J.C. virus underlying, and again, it happens in about a third of our whole population, um, in regards to J.C. virus specifically, J.C. virus is asymptomatic. So we don't actually know um, we have J.C. virus until we test for it. So that's one thing that you can test for before starting natalizumab is, J is for J.C. virus. And you, you can do this um, through an anti-JCV antibody. Um, what happens in J.C. virus, if J.C. virus gets progressive, what can happen is this virus can essentially um, progress into causing progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, um, where basically there is a pretty, you know, large debilitating um, complication relating to the leukocytes, um, which is in multiple areas of the brain and the spinal cord. Um, and this PML can potentially be very debilitating or even fatal. So one of the considerations with this drug is that it does need to be closely monitored. It does have a REMS program associated, and the REMS program is called TOUCH, um, which we'll talk about a little more in class whenever we do that. And it's also important with this agent because it is a very strong um, immune suppressant that we do not administer live vaccinations with this therapy. The next agent we'll talk about that is second line is fingolimod, and it prevents lymphocyte exiting from the lymph nodes. Um, unlike the other two agents in the second line therapy um, classification, it is available PO. The dosing of this medication is 0.5 milligrams by mouth daily, and its reduction in clinical relapse rate is about 55%. So you see a trend here in that the clinical relapse rate reduction rates are much higher in the second degree class, or I'm sorry, the second line um, group of medications for MS than they are in the first for the most part. Um, however, again, with the second line medications, you have a lot of nasty side effects. One of the hallmark side effects of fingolimod is bradycardia and AV block. And that's why it's actually contraindicated in many different um, cardiac disease states such as, such as MI, unstable angina, um, TIA stroke, decompensated heart failure, Mobitz type 2, second or third degree AV block, sinus syndrome. If you have a prolonged QT um, interval such as greater than 500 milliseconds or equal to 500 milliseconds, um, as well as if you have concurrent use of a 1A or 3A antiarrhythmic um, via the Vaughn Williams classification. So um, in any case, it's important to obtain a baseline EKG on these patients. Um, I would also potentially obtain um, an echo on these patients, particularly if they have heart failure. Um, however, you probably should not give this um, agent to patients who have heart failure as it can be made worse and it's obviously contraindicated. Um, some other adverse effects um, include transaminase elevations, which can eventually um, lead to hepatotoxicity and liver failure, headache, decreased pulmonary function, um, hypersensitivity reactions, serious viral or fungal infections. Again, PML is another warning with this drug, though. PML is not as prominent with fingolimod as it is with tasabri or natalizumab. And then another warning with this drug is it may... Um, have a risk of developing malignancies or cancer. Um, again, it is essentially um, to an extent an immunosuppressant, so it's important not to administer live vaccinations while on this therapy. The last agent in the second line grouping is alumtuzumab or Lemtrada. 
and Lemtrada is a humanized monoclonal antibody directed against CD52, and it causes rapid depletion of CD52 positive B and T cells. So essentially another immune suppressant here. It is available IV. The dosing of this medication is 12 milligrams IV once daily for five days, followed in a year, in one year, by the same dosing once daily for three days. So you see here that this medication, just by the way it's dosed, is relatively potent um, and could potentially have a, a significant level of adverse effects associated with it. It does have a decent reduction in clinical relapse rate of about 50 to 55 percent. In regards to adverse effects, because it is IV, infusion-related reactions can occur. You, have, you may have nasal pharyngitis, autoimmune disorders, thyroid disease, pneumonitis, as well as infections and malignancies. Some considerations with alemtuzumab is that it, it also has its own REMS program because it needs to be monitored um, very carefully. And that REMS program is called Lemtrada REMS. We'll talk about that more in class. Um, with this medication, because it is relatively strong and there's a lot of um, infusion-related reactions with this medication, um, it's important to pre-medicate patients with corticosteroids, acetaminophen, and potentially an oral antihistamine as well, um, such as Benadryl. It is contraindicated in HIV, um, it being the only agent that is contraindicated in HIV. And it's also um, contraindicated in many other disease states per the Canadian level, I'm sorry, per the Canadian labeling, um, specifically TB, um, which you should screen for both HIV and TB prior to alemtuzumab therapy. Again, do not menstrualize vaccines while on therapy. This is a pretty potent immunosuppressant and can actually be given sometimes in, um, um, in prevention of rejection for um, transplants where immunosuppressive therapy is highly needed. So now that we've talked about the first and second line therapies, now we'll discuss some therapies that don't necessarily fall into first or second line therapy as of yet, um, per se. And the reason for this is because a lot of these medications, um, not necessarily just on this list, but a lot of MS drugs in general are constantly being developed. Um, if you would have studied MS five years ago or maybe 10 years ago, um, this talk would be completely different than it is today because a lot of these drugs did not even exist 10 years ago. Um, there are obviously some drugs, um, some chemo drugs, specifically like mitoxantron or rituximab that did exist. But even with a lot of the treatment options and the research that's being done with MS, it's constantly developing. So some other treatment options we have on the table for MS are corticosteroids. Diclizumab or Zimbrida, Ocrelizumab or Ocrevus, Dalfampranine or Empyra, Mitoxantrone or Novantrone, Rituximab or Rituxin. Um, there's also another agent called Ibutilast, though it, this one has not been approved in the U.S. I believe it's currently approved in Japan. And then you also have your non-pharmacological therapy options that you can do as well. In regards to corticosteroids, um, the belief mechanism for corticosteroid use in MS is that it prevents inflammatory cytokine activation, inhibition of T and B cell activation, and it may prevent immune cells from entering the CNS, so that's not necessarily known. Obviously, corticosteroids are available IV or PO, and you see the dosage here of methylpred is that it's about 500 to 1250 milligrams IV or PO daily, for about three to seven days. And you can also convert that to other um, steroid medications like prednisone, orally, dexamethasone, a variety of different things. But just to give you an idea, um, methylprednisone, um, um, 1,000 milligrams IV or PO um, for three days is a common regimen given in MS flares, as well as um, other types of um, 
flares like acute rejection for transplant, etc. Essentially, what they're trying to do here is to prevent this cytokine activation and, and essentially prevent a lot of their immune response from occurring. The big thing with corticosteroids is that they do not reduce relapses um, necessarily, or they're not used um, prophylactically to re reduce relapses. They're used acutely for relapses. So you're not going to give a patient chronic steroids to reduce relapses or flares associated with MS. You're only going to give um, corticosteroids to a patient who actually has an MS flare going on at that time. In that case, you would give this pretty high dose of methylpred to a patient, not necessarily for chronic therapy and must be used acutely. Some um, general adverse effects of corticosteroids include GI upset, insomnia, mood disturbances, and hyperglycemia. Um, Diclizumab is a newer agent that actually just came out um, last year in 2016. It's a humanized monoclonal antibody directed against CD25 subunit of IL-2 receptors. This drug is available subcutaneously and is dosed about at 150 milligrams sub-Q once monthly. Some adverse effects um, regarding diclizumab include allergic skin reactions, um, autoimmune disorders, infections, nasopharyngitis. One of the hallmark side effects of diclizumab is hepatotoxicity. And that's actually one of the big reasons why this drug is a REMS drug, is that it's monitored for its risk of um, liver failure. Um, it may also be associated with neuropsychiatric events, um, TB, as well as malignancies. So obviously the considerations with this drug is that it is a REMS monitored drug, and the REMS program for this one's called Zimbrida REMS, for its brand name. Um, this drug is essentially only reserved for people who have failed at least two prior MS medications. And that's actually in the product's labeling. That's not just something um, I put here. This is actually something that you can find in the product's labeling or in different drug bases like Lexicomp. It's important to screen for hepatitis B and hepatitis C and TB prior to therapy, as it may um, reactivate um, latent forms of these diseases in patients who have had active forms of the disease prior or just have latent forms of the disease in general. And again, um, do not administer live vaccines while in this therapy, and specifically for this drug four months after as well. Um, the next agent we'll talk about is ocrelizumab or ocrevus. This is the newest drug on the MS scene right now. It was actually FDA approved, I believe, in March of this year. It's a humanized monoclonal antibody directed against CD20 or B lymphocytes. So I could actually like to think about this drug as a sister to rituximab, because if you know what the mechanism of rituximab is, is it's actually an also a CD20 inhibitor, more or less. Um, this agent is available IV. The dosing of this agent um, you get 300 milligrams IV on day one, then you get 300 milligrams IV two weeks later, and then you'll get 600 milligrams IV six months later. Um, so it's a very regimented schedule. In reference to ocrelizumab, adverse effects include respiratory tract infections or other infections, infusion-related reactions, and that obviously can occur from any kind of parenteral injection. Um, depression, as well as back pain. This agent is contraindicated in active hepatitis B as it may convert latent hepatitis B into active hepatitis B. This medication needs pre-medications with methylprednisolone as well as an antihistamine. And you can also pair that or um, triad that with acetaminophen due to its infusion-related reactions. And again, with these agents that are very strong immunosuppressants, like this drug is here, ocrelizumab, do not administer live vaccinations while on therapy until B cell until B cell repletion. So switching gears a little bit, now we'll talk about a drug 
that's not necessarily used to prevent clinical relapses, but it's actually used to help MS patients improve their walking speed. And that agent is called dalfamperdine or Empyra. This agent is a potassium channel antagonist. Um, and essentially what this agent does is it improves walking speed. It is available PO as you see here in the picture and it's dosed at 10 milligrams by mouth twice a day. But um, it may um, require a dose increase potentially. Um, it does not, and again, I'll emphasize this, does not reduce clinical relapse rate. So it's not like the other drugs that we've talked about previously where the relapse rate will be reduced if you give this drug consistently. It's only used to help walking speed. Um, one of the hallmark side effects of dalfamperdine is seizures. Um, and I don't know necessarily pathophysiologically what the mechanism behind this seizure activity is, but um, one thing that does affect it is um, renal function. So patients that have poor renal function, particularly creatinine clearances less than 50, um, are not able to take this medication as a contraindication because in patients with poor renal function, this medication doesn't eliminate very well. And as a result, you may be at an even increased even higher risk of the seizures that can occur from this medication. Other adverse effects include urinary tract infections, insomnia, dizziness, back pain, and balance disorders. Again, it's contraindicated in creatinine clearance less than 50, and it's contraindicated in seizure disorders. In regards to mitoxantrone or novantrone, mitoxantrone is an agent commonly used in a lot of um, cancer patients um, in different oncologic settings. It targets proliferating immune cells, inhibits proliferation, and induces apoptosis of T and B cells, macrophages, and other antigen-presenting cells. Um, it is available IV, and it's dosed at 12 milligrams per meter squared, um, essentially the patient's BSA, um, IV every three months. It does have a maximum lifetime dose of 140 milligrams per meter squared because higher doses may be potentially lethal and the risk may outweigh the benefit at that point. Adverse effects of mitosantron include menstrual disorders, leukopenia. One unique thing that mitosantron does is it actually does just color the urine and the urine may become blue-green. Um, it causes nausea, alopecia, and another thing that might as intro known is arrhythmias and cardiotoxicity. So you may want to obtain a baseline EKG and an echo for these patients to assess for cardiac rhythm and for um, left ventricular ejection fraction as well as heart, um, heart hemodynamics. Some considerations of myosantron specifically is it is pregnancy category D. You want to screen prior to therapy start and do not administer live vaccinations while on therapy because it is a very potent immunosuppressant. The last agent we'll talk about for MS and also kind of in this myosantron rituximab and where they fit at technically in practice is that these are traditionally last line options more or less and they're not necessarily written um, concretely into a guideline but they are potentially used for MS. So with rituximab, rituximab is a chimeric mirroring human monoclonal antibody directed against CD20. So it's kind of similar to the mechanism we saw with ocrelizumab. Um, regulating cell cycle initiation and differentiation. It's available IV. The dosing for this agent is 1,000 milligrams IV every two weeks given yearly, or 375 milligrams per meter squared IV weekly times four doses. Its adverse effects include infusion-related reactions, and what you can do for these infusion-related action um, reactions is pre-medicate with acetaminophen or an antihistamine. Um, and if they do have an infusion-related reaction, what you can do is stop the infusion and then once the patient gets a little better, restart it at a reduced rate. Um, because it is a potent immunosuppressant, infections are possible with rituximab, as well as um, PML again here. 
though the warning the, the warning with PML with rituximab is a little bit um, on the lower risk side compared to the other agents such as natalizumab or tisabri. Some considerations with rituximab are to screen for hep B prior to start as rituximab does have pretty big warnings for um, hep B reactivation. Um, again, pre-medicate with acetaminophen and an antihistamine like Benadryl and do not administer live vaccinations while on this therapy. So now that we've talked about the actual pharmacotherapy agents used for MS, now let's talk about some non-pharmacological things that you can do. Um, obviously, if you encourage exercise in these patients and get these patients moving around and, you know, living a healthy lifestyle, that may actually um, reduce a little bit of the progression of the disease, um, which can be helpful to some patients. I actually do know an MS patient and she is very active um, in actually exercising and moving around a lot. So those things can be very beneficial. And, you know, I actually never actually knew she had MS until I actually heard about it from her. Um, another thing that you can do is rest. So you don't want to overexert yourself. Um, you want to obviously play within your limits and make sure that... Um, if you are doing very strenuous activities that you're careful because any kind of damage that you do to your body can have a more progressive effect um, if you have MS. You may use assistive devices such as canes. Um, obviously, it, we don't want patients to get to the point where they're fully disabled, but wheelchairs are obviously always an option for these patients if they're not able to move because they have just so much progressive disease. Um, that it's a little bit unavoidable. And then we also are concerned about physical speech and occupational therapy as well. So we want to make sure that the patients are able to move as well as they can, that neurologically they're still able to um, perform their activities of daily living and if they're not, get them help for act performing activities of daily living. So those are essentially some of the main non-pharmacological therapies for MS. But remember, in terms of overall therapy for MS, it not only includes the non-farm and the farm therapies for MS, but it also includes the treatment of all the complications we talked about earlier. So um, I'll refer you to the other um, mm -hmm. talks that you've had on the different complications, such as urinary incontinence, um, constipation, um, and a lot of the other different side effects, um, not necessarily side effects, but um, presentation type things that we see with MS. I'll refer you to those specific talks. In regards to treatment approach for MS, head-to-head um, -head comparisons of MS drugs are pretty limited, um, though there are some out there. The most important thing is that you want to make sure that parent, um, patients are adherent to treatment. And um, if they have a reason to not be adherent to treatment, that you encourage them to call um, their health care provider if they can't continue a medication for some reason, whether it be cost, side effects, um, insurance coverage, whatever the problem may be. There, um, even route sometimes may be a problem. Some patients may not be able to swallow properly. Some patients may not be able to have the manual dexterity to actually inject themselves with a sub-Q injection daily. So those are things that you obviously have to assess whenever you're assessing for adherence. Is this patient going to be able to, number one, obtain the medication, and number two, be compliant with it? If you do have intolerable side effects from one agent, you may want to switch agents. So you may switch between a first line and a first line drug. So going from one first line to a first to another first line. Or if your agents are limited, you might actually jump up to a second line if your disease progression has gotten worse. And that essentially goes to this next point about you may start a second line agent first line, so natalizumab, alemtuzumab, or fingolimod if your patient has a rapidly evolving form of MS, um, particularly that of relapsing remitting, because that 
comprises about 85% of MS patients. You want to consider off-label treatments if patients have an inadequate response to second-line agents. So a lot of the therapies that um, we listed um, in the latter half of the presentation, for example, like rituximab, um, has off-label use in MS because rituximab is traditionally used for B-cell lineage type um, cancers but it can be potentially used in MS. Um, and I'll also direct you to the reading assignment um, on MS for a little more details on how this treatment approach actually works in practice. Here are my references for today's talk. And we'll go back to our patient case now. GT is a 36-year-old female presenting to her physician for an annual checkup. She was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis three years ago after her second MS flare in two months. Following her MS flares, she's had no other MS flares and she's had no other symptoms. What type of multiple sclerosis does GT most likely have? The answer here is relapsing remitting. So remember, 85% of patients have relapsing remitting MS in general. Um, the other types of MS are progressive types of MS. So basically what that means is they continually get worse. Um, whether that be after they've had um, relapsing remitting MS previously, such as in secondary progressive, or in the case of primary progressive where it just starts and it gets worse. So here you have relapses and then you have area and have times of remission. That's my relapsing remitting is the answer here. The disease does not appear to be progressive this time because the patient does not have any other symptoms other than the two flares that she has had. So that's why the other three answers are not correct. The next question is, GT's MS has never been considered fully aggressive or rapidly evolving by her physician. So essentially what this means here is that um, she may not necessarily need a second line therapy um, up front. Which of the following agents is GT most likely to be on considering her disease course? The answer here is Tecfidera. So if you remember, Tecfidera is one of our first line agents. It is PO. Um, and it has a pretty decent clinic um, reduction in clinical relapse rate of about 50%. So it would be the most appropriate option here since GT's MS is not considered necessarily aggressive or rapidly evolving by our physician. The other three agents that are listed here are all second-line agents, with alentuzumab and natalizumab being parenteral and fengolimod being um, your PO option here, more or less. So in this case, if they did have aggressive or rapidly evolving disease, you may actually start with one of these three instead of um, starting with a first-line agent such as dimethylfumarate. However, because this patient is not considered aggressive or rapidly evolving in terms of their MS, um, Tecfidera or dimethylfumarate is the most appropriate answer here. And the last question, which of the following agents may cause GT to have bradycardia and AV block requiring cardiac monitoring after the first dose is administered? Answer here is fengolimod or Jelenia. Um, one important point I kind of want to bring up with Jelenia that we didn't mention earlier is that Jelenia or fengolimod was actually a RIMS drug previously. It actually just got taken off of the RIMS list. So it doesn't necessarily need to be monitored um, in the RIMS fashion for um, monitoring for bradycardia and AV block, though it's probably still recommended among most experts. Um, and personally, what I would do is I would probably still monitor um, these patients very carefully for bradycardia and AV block as well as the other cardiac complications um, because they can happen even after the first dose. So a lot of times what happens is that they'll give the patient the first dose in whatever whatever healthcare setting they're in and monitor the patient. So while it's not a REMS drug necessarily anymore, it's still important to monitor for cardiac complications as a result of fengolimod. If you have any questions about today's talk, please let me know. Thank you and have a great day.